Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I'm introducing today's sermon by talking about introductions. And that's because our reading is from our first reading is the introduction to the book of Acts. A lot of books or movies begin with a backstory. A backstory is not part of the main narrative, but it's a, a bigger a story behind it, you might say. A backstory helps the reader or the viewer to understand the big picture a little better. A backstory prepares us to look for important events or themes that we might otherwise miss. Often, we see those even before the characters in the story grasp what is going on. And this gives the reader or the viewer an advantage, some insight, a warning for what to be looking for. For instance, the Lord of the Rings movies begins with a story of a nearly forgotten battle where an ancient enemy, Sauron, is miraculously defeated. But Sauron is not wholly defeated. His essence continues to exist hidden in a ring. And as long as the ring exists, so does Sauron. In many stories, what seems like insignificant moments or choices are actually hugely important, and backstories can help us see their significance. Frodo's decision not to put on a ring that would make him invisible, a national leader who turns down an opportunity to gain a surefire advantage by seizing the ring of power. Now, these seem like missed opportunities, but those who know what's going on recognize these renunciations of power are actually what save their world. The beginning of the book of Acts is likewise a backdrop for the rest of what's going to happen in it. It's, after all, think about it, it's the last words and instructions of Jesus before his ascension. And it sets the stage for what's about to take place. The disciples are asking and expecting Jesus to change things from a national perspective. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Um, this sounds a lot like campaign slogans from either party uh, because it gets at what people are really hoping for. Is Jesus coming to implement national change we need like President Obama promised? Or is he going to make Israel great again, as President Trump might put it? The answer, I think, that Jesus gives is no. Jesus was not coming to introduce a kingdom like the kingdoms of this world. Rather, in, in fact, it was going to be a community much like what the disciples were already part of. God's kingdom will be built not by force, but by faith. And that is going to come up over and over in the book of Acts. It would be a community based not upon state borders, but upon commitment to repentance and trust in the Lord. It was not spread by Alexander's or Caesar's, but by Peter's and Paul's, James and John's. It would also be worldwide. But how would it take place? Will it take place now, the disciples want to know? Will it be an obvious victory? Well, Jesus wouldn't immediately answer or scratch the disciples' itch to know what would happen next. He tempers their expectations instead, and he adjusts their focus. They will wait for the Holy Spirit. After Jesus ascends, the angels prod the disciples as they're staring to heaven. Why are you staring up at the sky? He's coming back. But you, in the meantime, have work to do. Do what he told you. So they return to Jerusalem to wait, plan, and pray. The church does receive power. Repeatedly in our, our lesson, we heard about the power of the Holy Spirit, and the same thing was in our gospel reading from Luke chapter 24. And, but the church doesn't receive power over nations, but the power of the Holy Spirit, which is actually a better power. 
And that means that like the apostles, our primary duty is not to make people believe or force others to act in the right way. Rather, we bear witness to the good news in our life, in our words, and in our our community and fellowship together. And that's because the good news of Jesus overshadows all the bad news that we could scroll through or watch daily. Our calling is to live like the folks in Acts did, devoting themselves to God, to our neighbors, to prayer, word, and fellowship. Jesus' ascension also reminds us that he has a job to do, and he's left us with a job. His job is to rule over heaven and earth. You might say the big picture responsibility is his. And we don't really have to change the world or make all the problems go away. You might say, he's God. He's got this. But we do have a responsibility, a responsibility to listen to the Holy Spirit as we focus on the instructions Jesus left us. We can't fix the world, but we certainly can help our neighbors, our families, our communities, or um, anyone who we get the opportunity who crosses our path, our path or who we get to care for. Acts is full of reminders that many people won't accept Jesus' way of living. They won't even put up with it, uh, or they might not like or accept what Paul preaches or Peter says. But again, we trust Jesus, who is the ruling and reigning Lord of heaven and earth, to take care of matters that are above our pay grade. Meanwhile, we simply testify in word and deed and life to the cross and resurrection and to the truth and compassion Jesus preached and lived. Philippians chapter 3, Paul encourages us with these words, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as the enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, and their God is their belly, their glory, their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. As as Paul puts it there, our our whole purpose and life are shaped by waiting for Jesus' return. If we're not living like Jesus Jesus is coming back, we're, we're missing something. Our decisions, therefore, sometimes probably look naive or foolish to the world, but but we believe something that they have not heard or not allowed themselves to hear. Jesus has promised to return and to put things back how they should be. So life is no longer just about what I can squeeze out of it or me fixing it on my own. Nor are those around me simply tools I can use to make life better or to make me feel better. There is a way the world should be, and we testify to it. And when Jesus returns, he will fix it. Um, There's uh, And one of the best ways to convince others of that is not just to tell them, but to show them. You know, as as a coach... I can tell a soccer or a basketball player what the proper fundamentals are, but players always do better when they are shown what to do. As a parent, if I want my kids to learn a new skill or chore, I almost always have to get up and show them the first couple times how to do it. Just simply saying it's barely ever enough. It's often the same when it comes to new Christians or when trying to witness to people about the new life we have in Christ. We must show others what the new, better way of living is. They must see it in practice. So, like the angels told the disciples, we too have a job to do. Many people would never bother to read about the Sermon on the Mount, but they can understand and appreciate honesty, integrity, and compassion. Our world faces a myriad of challenges, and just like we can't face our problems alone, neither can the world face its problems alone. The church has been called to help and to heal and to speak truth 
We follow Jesus, trusting in his promises and, and trying to follow in his footsteps in how we treat and uh, others and how we live. Jesus has called us to a higher purpose. That's an appropriate as we think about Ascension Sunday and Jesus ascending into heaven. We have a higher purpose. Jesus has ascended to sit at the Father's right hand to rule over in heaven, or heaven and earth because he has a higher purpose. He intercedes on our behalf so that we are welcomed in God's presence, that God no longer holds our sins against us, but forgives us and welcomes us in. Jesus denies and refuses any other power that might try to claim us, including sin, death, and the devil. They can't have us anymore because we are the Lord's. And we too have a higher purpose. We're no longer simply in it for ourselves. We don't see the world or creation or our fellow human beings as tools or competition. And, and likewise, we, we, don't, we no longer have to orient our lives and our bodies simply for pleasure or worldly gain. No, instead we are mirrors, dimly reflecting the brilliant light of our Savior. The church's higher purpose is to set an example to the world of how relationships, fellowship, and forgiveness can and should be, among other things. We are called to show people how to live with joy, compassion, and commitment to Christ, no matter what challenges or dangers we might face. We've been called to a higher purpose, because, after all, we have a Lord who is ascended on high and will one day return to restore all things. In Jesus' name, amen.